Hey guys, very excited to invite you to ReformCon 2022 by this standard. ReformCon 2022, we have an amazing lineup of speakers. We have Dr. James White, Dr. Joe Boot, we have Toby Sumter, we have David Bonson. I'm speaking at the conference. It's going to be amazing. We have time where there's performances. There's going to be some entertainment. We have an after party. We have time for fellowship. So for all things ReformCon 2022, you just need to go to reformcon.org. You can go there to get your tickets. You can also go to reformcon.org to book your hotel and accommodations. Also, if you are a Christian business owner, you want to participate, you want to set up a booth, you want to be a vendor, we'd love to have you. You can do all of that at reformcon.org, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all there. Reformation Day weekend, ReformCon 2022, by this standard. ReformCon 2022, by this standard. Non-rock a boat us must stop. I don't want to rock the boat. I want to sink it. Are you going to bark all day, little doggy, or are you going to bite? Brett, delusional. The, yeah, I love you, Jeff. I delusional. Jeff. Yeah, delusional is okay in your worldview. I'm an animal. You don't chastise chickens for being delusional. You don't chastise pigs for being delusional. So you calling me delusional using your worldview is perfectly okay. It doesn't really hurt. <laughs> she hung up on me. Yeah! Oh! <laughs> What? What? Desperate times call for faithful men and not for careful men. The careful men come later and write the biographies of the faithful men, lauding them for their courage. Go into all the world and make disciples. Not go into the world and make buddies. Not to make brosives. Right. Don't go into the world and make homies. Right. Disciples. I got, yeah. I got a bit of a jiggle neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, Pastor. When we have the real message of truth, we cannot let somebody say they're speaking truth when no. they're not. Take an amazing journey to a place that will blow your mind and move your heart so you will never be the same again. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. That is Colossians 2, verses 1 through 5. What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Apologia Radio. Got a little bit different lineup today. Uh, Pastor Jeff is in Houston, I believe. That's right. Mm -hmm. You're correct. <laughs> I had to think about it. Uh, he's in Houston speaking at a conference for our good friend, Bradley Pierce, who's been on here a number of times. It's so going to be a fire conference. Yeah. I don't even know. I just know he's there. So, anyways. Yeah, good speaker lineup. We've been busy. Uh, so, yes, wish I could be there. Um, but you just heard the voice of old Ballywind, Zachary Conover. Yeah, that name has grown in ways that would surprise you. Really? Yeah. Like the instance I was just describing. Oh, oh, that's... Lack yeah. of breath oh, yeah. and... yeah. Too much wind I at times. Even, <laughs> didn't even put two and two together on that one. Uh, very funny. Inside, inside. Uh, very funny. Uh, speaking of Bally wind, we are going back to Ireland here. We'll be there. I, we mentioned it last or two weeks ago, I think. Uh, we will be there um, early September. So like three weeks from now, we'll be there for about 10 days. So be watching. We're working on nailing down the speaking engagement, stuff like that. Uh, but very excited. For sh we're planning on having, I shouldn't say for sure yet, but we're planning on having a uh, rally at the Capitol in Northern Ireland in Stormont and uh, speaking at some other places as well to help our, help our brothers and sisters there with Let Them Live and Abolish Abortion Northern Ireland. So if you're there, uh, come see us. Joy, the girl to my left. Hello. How How's are you? How's it going? Good. Good. Doing good. Soli Deo Gloria. Mm-hmm. Feeling good. Yeah. I almost actually wore that shirt today, but oh, you guys would have well. been twinsies. <laughs> we would have little been twinsies. Matchy match. A little yeah. EAN on each side of you. <laughs> it wasn't meant to be. No, it wasn't. Um, 
You guys aren't looking for jobs, are you? No? I feel a segue coming <laughs> on. <laughs> I, f- I think you guys um, are good with your... Are we looking for jobs? No. <laughs> uh, I, I don't believe you can answer you, that. You would know if I'm not I don't believe you are. <laughs> yeah. I was just curious because our friends, are, some notice. our friends of the Armored Republic are hiring. So if you were looking Ooh, for a job, uh, okay. they're hiring. Um, did you know, Zachary Conover, the famous first battles of the American War for Independence, the battles of Lexington and Concord, have an important piece of history behind them. They were fought to resist the British taking away guns and ammunition from Americans living in those areas. Did you know that? I always wanted to read more history. Well, I'm going to give you some history. <laughs> Firearms are the first of primary tools of liberty, but a growing number of freemen, I love that term, are realizing that firearms are only the beginning. The next most important tool of liberty is body armor, which we've, which I've worn on this show. A defensive tool of liberty <laughs> to match the offensive capabilities of guns. This is where Armored Republic comes in. Armored Republic, previously known as AR-500 Armor, equips the free men of America with the tools of liberty that are necessary to defend their God-given rights to the honor of Christ the King. We're reaching out to you because we need more hands at the plow. The Armored Republic is looking for more nearby Christians, so that would be if you're in the Phoenix area. Um, Lost my spot. (laughs) Sorry. Uh, There we go. Looking for more nearby Christians to take up opportunities in operations marketing, sales, customer service, and elsewhere. Our workplace culture is built on 14 values that reflect the Ten Commandments and the rest of the wisdom communicated throughout Scripture. We work to be aggressively Christian. Love that. In all parts of the business, and we work to consistently reward good stewards. If you're interested in helping armed free men in America to resist tyranny, check out the careers page on our website at ar500armor.com backslash careers. Love those guys. We're glad to be partnering with them. And speaking of people living aggressively Christian, I'm going to bring in our guest today, Dr. Benjamin Merkel from New St. Andrews College, who we are now also partnering with. I am very, very excited about that. That's exciting. Yes. Uh, So, Ben, what's going on, brother? Not a whole lot. Very happy to be with you guys today. Uh, you are uh, on the beach, basically. I, I am. I'm just a little, I'm a short distance from the beach. So uh, wrapping up a business trip that in um, the kindness of God put me at Laguna Beach for the moment. So it's hard to complain about that. Yeah, we were set up at Ben. It was like, oh, I shut the door so you couldn't hear the ocean. <laughs> Thank you. It's true, actually. Thank it's you like for, Thank you for sparing our, us. Our bedroom is like right on the beach. Yeah. As we're like dying here, actually, it's been okay. It's, I've been here hot, for 15 bro. years, it's but hot. no, this is the most mild summer we've had that I can. It's been what, really is, mild. what is mild there? I don't think we've hit mean? 120 yet, have we? We're in August. Usually, August is like 120 the whole month, and I don't think we've hit it once this summer. It's rained a lot, which yeah, is just good. Lots of it's, the so it's the been humid. Is, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Been, we've had humidity, but it but hasn't hit it's 120. It's been like 105. Yeah, that's not. With a little breeze, I'll take it. Yeah. It's a 110 bit and night. above that really yeah. sucks it out of you. When that's consistent week mm-hmm. over week over week like that, that's when it starts to wear. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So, anyways, um, I still wouldn't mind. But yeah, a, a breeze, breeze coming off the ocean. Yeah, uh, we don't have that here at all. Yeah. No. <laughs> Ben's got the Ben's got the opposite problem in Moscow though, right? Yeah, that's true. Shoveling snow while we're shoveling sunshine. <laughs> How far are you guys? We do have that. We have all four seasons. How far are you from the ocean there? You're probably about the same as us, I'm guessing. About five, six hours? In, in Moscow? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's about a it's about a five-hour drive to Seattle. Yeah. So you're basically ocean. directly north of us, so that's about mm-hmm. what it is for us as well. Not to Seattle. To, uh, <laughs> to the ocean. The ocean. <laughs> right. I was like, I don't know about to- that. <laughs> Um, that's hilarious. Uh, before we get into this, I wanted to mention, uh, I just, I, I learned here this morning that our, our dear brother, Dr. Kenneth Talbot went home to be with the Lord this morning. So I wanted to mm-hmm. give a little shout out to him. He's been such a dear friend and brother to us and, uh, spent a lot of time with us and, and helped us. Um, so we're going to miss him dearly. And that man, uh, that man could talk. 
uh, mm. and I loved it. And if, if and one thing I always loved about Doctor T is, you anytime I had a question about anything, he would literally pick up the phone and call you, call me, and it, you had to schedule a minimum of an hour because he would just keep going and be like, uh, Doctor Talbot, isn't it like two a.m. your time? <laughs> He's like, oh, I'm grading papers, <laughs> and I'm like, you're crazy. Wow. Uh, but what a yeah, what a Never sleep. What a wonderful man he was, and we're gonna miss him. And uh, Ben, I saw you nodding. Do you did you know Dr. Talbot? No, I didn't. Mm. I didn't. But I, I I'd heard about his passing. Yeah. And, uh, so another president of another great uh, institution, uh, Woodfield mm. uh, Seminary, Woodfield.edu. Mm. You guys can check that out. Uh, anyways, just wanted to say that before we go any further, but. Uh, Okay, Damn. so Ben, you got a lot going on, um, and we, you know, we were kind of talking about we were going to talk about this this episode, and there seems to be, and I was Zach has a really good parallel he wants to bring up at some point, but um, there's there's it seems to be a trend in higher education right now, and uh, yeah. so I'll just let you I'll let you open up with that and tell us kind of what you want to talk about, and we'll go from there. Yeah. So when we were back and forth, yeah, I think one of the things that's really interesting right now, just on the national scene, is the way higher ed is kind of driven off the cliff. And it's kind of funny because everybody's been seeing it coming for a long time and nobody nobody bothered to prepare for it or adjust anything. And, and the cliff is um, over the last two years, I think we've had total enrollment across the U.S. has dropped by 1.4 million which is wow. just under 10% of total enrollment. I mean, that's crazy. And and the people are wanting to think it was the COVID moment and, and definitely COVID um, coincided with it and probably exacerbated a little bit. But this was mm -hmm. a cliff we were driving off regardless because you've got a, a demographic um, drop where, um, and, and like I said, this has been published on for a while that as the birth rate in the US has dropped, there's a demographic uh, um, well, Cliff, that we've driven off where there, there aren't the students to go to fill the colleges, but nobody has adjusted or planned for it. But you take that and then you combine that with the fact that college is getting increasingly difficult to justify its usefulness. Yeah. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. why, um, why do you need, because, because what we've done is we've started saying that basically you have to have a college degree in order to get a job or yep. in order to get a good job. And that's, that's a total con that colleges um, uh, perpetuate. Um, and there's a whole thing there. It's basically um, how do you, how do you talk a incoming freshman who's 18 years old into signing up for 50 or $60,000 worth of student loans over the course of four years? Right. Um, you know, it, it's funny, like a student loan, Think of what you have to do to um, qualify for debt in almost any other situation. The student loan is the only debt you qualify for by demonstrating that you can't possibly pay it back. <laughs> you know, like, like I don't have the money, therefore you you get this this loan. <laughs> You're and the only way you can justify <laughs> that is the jobs. And so we say, well, you have to have this degree to get this job, but that's just becoming that's a lie, and it's becoming increasingly exposed. Uh, for that, because I think a lot of companies are looking at college graduates and saying, you know what, I would do a better job getting an 18 year old and teaching myself. It'd be far cheaper and far more effective for teaching them the skills that I want them to get. So there, you've got that whole thing kind of getting unmasked. And then on top of all that, then you had the COVID moment. So with all those things happening together, you've seen this this complete drop in uh, enrollment. And and but you don't see colleges doing anything to prepare for it. And you know, the argument I'd make is, I think I include this in the email with you, is that colleges are demonstrating the same kind of hubris that we were seeing, say, like um, banks do uh, mm -hmm. yeah. 12 years ago, where, where they they have this sense that I'm too big to fail. America can't go without me. So whatever happens, the federal government will come in and bail us out. Mm. Um, we, we know that somewhere over the next couple of weeks, supposedly, I mean, Biden keeps saying he's going to make this decision, but we've been told that he's going to make the decision in August about student loan forgiveness. Um, and that's that's ignoring the fact that a lot of other student loan forgiveness have been happening. Billions have been forgiven already, just kind of quietly on the side. But there's a big student loan forgiveness package that's coming. And it's just another one of those federal government bailouts for an industry that believes it's too big to fail. So 
we we call it you know you got big big pharma big tech big eva and so uh we're kind of starting to talk about big ed um yeah big ed is the the bloated bureaucracy of the american college system that believes that it, it exists by sort of like federal decree and that mm -hmm. it's subject to the free market and the demands uh, or lack of demand from the free market because the federal government is responsible to keep big ed alive yeah there's okay so there's a number of things i want to so many things address about i know that, yeah. yeah we could go for hours this. but the one thing i want to say real quick is that the the student loan forgiveness yeah, uh right it's not free somebody's paying no. for it <laughs> right well and they haven't stopped issuing yeah. they're forgiving loans that they haven't stopped yeah issuing no yeah and, and and right now one of the other big major initiatives um is the um all the colleges are pushing for this and i think it's highly likely this will go through is to double the size of the pell grant they want to double the pell grant um which is well from the students perspective is totally free i'm not paying that yeah, back and sure. that's supposed to double and so i think we'll probably have student loan forgiveness and the double pell grant in the very near future which and like you uh, and that'll uh, help inflation a lot. I, I was just yeah. thinking about that um, student loan forgiveness. It's not an elimination of debt. It's a transference yeah, of debt exactly. from one party to another party mm -hmm. that wasn't responsible for paying it back. Right. Yeah. So it's a form of institutionalized theft. Exactly. Correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's, it's really ridiculous. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Um, so... So going back, one other thing I want to mention is just my own experience. Going back to what you were saying, some somewhere in there, because uh, uh, you had so many good points. Um, mm -hmm. You know, before I was full time ministry, and this was actually kind of partially what put me into full time ministry. Um, but like, I I have a degree in construction management, and I you know I had a ton of student loan debt and all that stuff, which praise God I'm finally free of. But um, you know that was that was my background and my degree and all that. And, you know, you what you were saying was you, you're told in order to get a job, you know, you have to have a degree and stuff. And uh, growing up in the construction industry, like, I, you know, I was I bit into that and got this fancy degree. And then, um, you know, that did help me get to Arizona. That's another story. But like when the, the, my point is, that was when the economy was good. Uh -huh. It was helpful. But as soon as 2008 hit and it hit hard here in the housing industry and in the construction industry, everything came to a standstill. Um, my degree was yeah. worthless. It was just a piece yeah. of paper. And when it came down to it, uh, the people that were worse actually hiring were hiring, uh, people with experience and they could care less about the degree, you know, and I had, yeah. I only had, you know, a year and a half of actual project manager experience at that point in my life. And nobody cared about it and I couldn't yeah. get a job, you know, and praise God again, that was him orchestrating me, pushing me into full-time ministry but but my point is i i live that it happened and uh you know i've i say this all the time like you're better off going to trade school or starting your own business uh and and, and getting debt that way if you need to than you know to mm -hmm. have a piece of paper that's going to put you at mcdonald's working minimum wage um right. you know and of course that gets in a whole nother issue in the workforce right now with yeah nobody wants to work because of sleepy joe handing them money to sit at home and uh, you know, I'm sure it's the same. Yeah. In, I'm sure it's the same in Moscow here. Like literally everywhere you go, they're signed to say hiring. Oh yeah. Everywhere. It's, it's still, a it's lot. crazy in Moscow how much, um, it, yeah, the, everybody is hiring. It's really impossible to get employees and especially in the construction industry. Um, you know, there's a lot of construction happening, but there, well, we really l lack the skilled tradesmen to do it. It, Dr. Merkel, I see, um, I, I worked at a university as an enrollment counselor for five years before coming here. So our okay. whole job- well, You're part of the problem. I'm our just... whole job was to get <laughs> enrollments, to get people to commit to yeah. a degree program, and they were sold uh -huh. on that very premise. Did that, you have a quota? Sure. Yeah, yeah. five yeah. enrollments a, yeah, a and, month and, per minimum. And the, and the line is, the line is, so, so, um, you're going to take out this amount of student loans. Right. So I'm going to show you the ROI. This is the salary of the yes, job exactly. yeah. that you'll get with this degree. And that that's the, it, and it's, um, it's comforting to parents because right. as parents, like, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here just 
Uh, we were just talking earlier. I just had my first daughter get married. All of my kids have just finished high school in the last few years. So five years, five kids really tight. And this, it's a really, um, I don't think I've prayed more for my kids than during this moment because you're, you're waiting to see like, what are you going to be, you know, what are you going to do? What, and, and to have a degree that, that tells you they will be this mm. is really nice. It's, it's comforting. You know, you're sending your kids away for school and you know, okay, yeah. she's enrolled in nursing. So that's so all. She'll be okay. Right. Yeah. The problem, the problem is, you know, um, at best, only 70% of them are going to finish with that degree. Some universities have like a 20, 25% degree completion rate mm. where you're signing up for these loans and everything for a degree that maybe one out of four are going to get at a, at, a, at a decent school, three out of four will get. The odds of them staying in that field, uh, or first of all, the odds of them staying in that degree, they're going to switch once they get into school and they start to see other things. And then the odds of them staying in the field that they graduated that degree with are also extremely s slim. Hardly mm. anybody works in the field that they majored in. Wow. So the idea that we're teaching them the necessary, you know, that we're certifying them for the necessary um, professional skills they'll need for this employment, it really is, it really is for the most part a con. Now, I, I believe that there are certain careers, actually nursing is probably one of them, sure. where the 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 technical skills that you're being certified for and what's going to go on in employment actually do line up. Nursing mm. is like that. I think some forms of engineering mm. are like that, but most of, most of the other fields, it's, it's not nearly as neat and tidy mm. as that. And we all tend to move laterally multiple times. My undergraduate degree is chemistry. I'm a liberal arts college president, but what sense does that make? Yeah. Uh, you know, you were, you were, you were, you were construction management and, um, I'm not even sure what your title is now. The producer of a podcast or pastor? <laughs> yeah, um, discipleship pastor. You know, like how how do you how do you how do you plot the necessary degree that you needed for doing the work yeah. that you do now that uh, gives you all those professional skills? It's just kind of a con, I think. I, I think it highlights something really important that I think I got from you, if I remember correctly, when you're talking about education with young people. This is never the conversation that I had with someone. Not what do you want to do, uh, but what kind of person do you want to become, right? That is yeah. the determining basis for how we should educate a human being based on yeah. who you should become. And that even changes the center of the discussion about education. I know that when I have these conversations with, uh, you know, nephews and nieces in my own family, I ask them, oh, what are you going to do in college? What are you going to study? What are you going there for? Uh, and they tell me, oh, orthodontics or whatever. And yeah. I'll say, oh, well, why do you want to do that? And they say, well, it'll make me money. Mm. And that yeah. is what I find to be the common answer when you ask mm. our youth why they're pursuing the directions that they are and the careers that they are. Well, because um, security or just it'll make me money, uh, not mm. this is who it'll train me to be, to be yeah. a difference maker in society and to be a leader and an yeah. innovator. It's to help prepare me to fit nicely and neatly into this box over here and this box over here. And I need this specializing piece of paper in order to complete that journey, which really, I mean, if you think about it, it kind of pulls away from, you know, it, it produces what you're talking about. Big pharma, yeah. big ed, kind of this cult of experts, right? Yeah. We have this, these group of all these experts that know how to do mm. these specific things, whereas the common man, the localized solution to the problem, whether we're talking about education or any other field, that's kind of, you know, pushed to the wayside. And we have all these experts and now you need to listen to the experts because we're the experts yeah. in this field. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I think that you're, you, you touched on something there that, that is really important, which is um, there, there's a very subtle change in the way we think that's actually quite profound about like who we are, what it is to be created in the image of God, what a person is and all of that. Um, because we have, have taken this idea of, first of all, everybody has to go to, college to get a job yeah. and you have to get this certificate that qualifies you for this job it makes this little path that everybody has to walk and it makes you really scared if you step off of it um like the idea is if you don't do it just right you're going to be a barista for life you know you're going to be a would you like fries <laughs> with that and that's the only thing that's the only thing you'll be able to do and so everybody is terrified of that and um, and what happens is it makes the world into this machine this like worrying machine 
And all of us are trying, like, like your goal in life is to be a good cog, you know, right. uh, for that machine. Because if you don't do it right, if you don't get the right degree and whatnot, then the machine is going to reject you and you'll be the barista for life. Mm. And, and parents are terrified of their children not being accepted by the machine and everything right. we do. And if you think about it, that machine is controlled by a really godless society that's trying to make us be something um, that is, I think, antithetical to what we're yeah. called to be. But if you if you flip that for a moment, like what's the difference between being that kind of cog? Well, it's being a free man, um, being somebody to go back to your your plug for yeah. um, AR five hundred or sorry, what's the, <laughs> yeah, what's the new name? Armored Republic. Okay, yeah. there we go. Yeah, that idea of being a free man, um, it's it's totally different. Like uh, if you if you get your head up and you look at the world around you, you realize. I mean, let, let's go ahead and say I would like to make a lot of money. All right. I don't think that's necessarily wrong. Um, I, I, would, I would like to, to, to make a lot of money. You know what? Entrepreneurial business and the, I, the idea that like I'm going to go start something. I'm going to start the business that doesn't exist yet. I'm going to start the business. That there's not even a degree for yet. That's what free people do. And that's what leaders do. The ones who are actually shaping our economy. And, and by um, believing we have to follow this path, we rob ourselves of the chance to be the free people who are actually shaping the society. Um, I would like to see our graduates make a lot of money, but I'd also like to see them uh, start churches. I'd like to see them start faithful families. They should be leading and shaping the culture rather than sort of passively receiving and having that thing imprinted on them so they can be a perfect cog. Mm -hmm. Well, and, um, you know, even as we just talk about that in light of student loans there the bible has something to say yes. about a borrower mm. and yeah. them being yeah. slave to the lender right. and so yeah we have this sort of this image of like security like now i know my kid or uh, now i know if i just enroll in this program i'll be set right and then i'll have this return of investment and uh, return on investment and it'll all be good and i'm set for my whole life and but um I mean, just the, the statistics on how long it takes people to pay off their student loans and the amount of interest oh, yeah. that they pay off. And you're talking about people, people who faithfully pay their monthly payment. And then six months into that, they go and they see what kind of dent they've made. And they're like, I haven't even. Yeah. I mean, that's not security. That's definitely <laughs> slavery for sure. You know who else was secure? Well, and, and it, <laughs> Israelites under you, Pharaoh. Well, right, like. <laughs> Look at the impact that having student loan debt has on you in those first couple of years after you graduate from college, because here's your chance to like go out and start something. Um, that's the moment. It's a really exciting moment when you graduate from college and it's like, go tackle the world. Um, I, I love seeing NSA students, graduates. I, mean, I have one graduate who, you know, he told me like he tried about three or four different things and a couple of them went really badly for him. He has ended up like living out of his car for a while. But it was because he was being risky and like, you know, trying things. And he's a very successful CFO of uh, impressive. He did his MBA at Notre Dame and is impressive CFO of a company in, in New Jersey now. But he, you don't get to be have those kinds of skills without taking risk and and being adventurous. But you will not take risk and you will not be adventurous when you have that student loan debt hang over you. And so people, um, they don't go into the ministry because they have student loan debt. They don't teach at a Christian school because they've got student loan debt and the salary is too low. A lot of people put off marriage because mm -hmm. they've got student yep, exactly. debt or they'll put off having children because exactly. they've got student loan debt. Yep. Yep. And all, all those things that we need for our culture to be growing, society to be advancing, um, we're crippling ourselves with this with this system. Man, that's so good. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to have you talk about NSA in a second, uh, but I mean, we were all obviously all raised in this culture where, you know, you go to college and the American dream and all this stuff. That piece of uh, paper. That piece of paper. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I, you know, I know all of us are now <laughs> uh, in a different position how we're raising our, yeah. our children, right? For like sure. you have a daughter, you have a daughter, I have two daughters. And, um, you know, my wife and I were talking about this just recently. You know, my oldest is almost 12. She's got several years yet but it's going to come like a freight train right like and you know you know my wife's like we're, we're raising our daughters to be good moms right like mm -hmm. that's what we want them to be and that's what they want to be and my wife's like well what if they want what if they want to go to college and i was like well then they're going to go to nsa 
<laughs> right? Like, that's the option. Like, and, and the reason is because I want them to be better uh, Christians in the world, and I want them to be better mothers, and that would be the answer for me. You know, yeah. unless, you know, unless they went in, like to cooking school or something like that. You know, <laughs> this you is know? some toxic so, like, patriarchy so, yeah, going on over there. <laughs> maybe, there's, maybe there's like a, a degree in knitting or something. I don't know. Like, you know, uh, actually, my great aunt, who I just praise God, I got to spend some time with her. I haven't seen her in like 18 years. I got to spend time with her about a month ago. She actually was, uh, she has her doctorate, I forget what her doctorate's in, but she was at Eastern Michigan. She taught, she was a home ec professor in college, oh. uh, you know, so that is, it is a thing. Huh. Uh, yeah, that's what she taught, and anyways. Um, so, Ben, I want you, because we, you know, it's been a while since we had you on, probably a lot of new listeners. Why is New St. Andrews far superior to uh, higher ed colleges, yeah. to state colleges, state <laughs> universities, stuff like that? The big ed. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it, it's probably a little bit, um, you know, the first half of the show is, um, you know, I, I think probably a lot of things I'm saying ring really true. And then you sort of scratch your head that it's a college president that's saying it because right. this is the stuff that we <laughs> we should be covering up and not telling anybody about. Um, but I um, NSA is quite a bit different. It's really interesting. So I talked about that um, enrollment, you know, cliff that everybody's driving off of NSA. We've had record freshman classes for the last three years in a row. Um, I think in the last five years, we've just about doubled the size of the undergraduate student wow. body. It's it's just really, really taking off. Um, so we're exploding right now. And the reason is that we're doing something very different. Um, and actually, I would let me re, let me rephrase that. Um, we are doing what college used to do, um, which is um, because for well over a thousand years, the Christian college has been absolutely essential and formative in the advance of Christian culture. Um, it, it has always been, I mean, there's a reason when Calvin, you know, one of his first things in Geneva was to make sure that he had a strong college uh, there in Geneva to advance what he's doing. When the Puritan pilgrims landed on the East coast of the American continent, one of the first things they did was start Harvard right. Right. because right. they believed they needed I mean, it's really crazy if you wow. think about it. They're like, it's in the first 20 years of landing on the coast. And so there's only a few thousand pilgrims that are living there. They're still carving out log cabins and all of that. And they start Harvard. And, wow. and here's the cr crazy thing. You had to be fluent in Latin in order to be accepted. Um, you know, the, the classes, the lectures were delivered in Latin. So you're like, you know, chopping down the tree, making your log cabin and then practicing your Latin so you can get into Harvard. Um, they they had an understanding of intellectual rigor and particularly intellectual rigor that was that was understood in the in the in the context of Christian community as being essential for passing on what they were doing. But there's a few things that that was clear. First of all, they did not believe that college was for everyone. I just think that that's that's a that's a um mm. I think that's a really unfair and unjust thing to do to expect that everybody is supposed to go to college. I just, um, it is a, it is a specific thing to help cultivate a specific set of skills, but it's not for everybody and it's not necessary for getting into every job. So the, the attempt to push college in to make it the, the necessary step that you have to go through in order to get into the workforce has been a con I think per perpetuated by colleges on the American mm -hmm. public in order for them to grow and charge yeah. massive tuition and whatnot. But that's just, we don't, um, colleges don't prepare people for specific jobs that well. I think that internships, apprenticeships are far better ways of learning that. Yeah. So the first thing is it's, it's not necessarily for everybody. And the, the second thing is that it's not about, um, again, I don't think that we're good at preparing people for specific technical skills that are better learned on the job, what colleges are really good at, and, and you, you can, I think we do it well, is digging down into the, the soft skills of the person, communication, critical thinking, the ability to read, to write, to speak, to persuade, to argue. Those, those things are things that we do really well. And, and the thing that, that you notice about it is it's not, um, it's not career specific. They tend to be skills that can go any number of different directions. Um, they're really the skills of, of um, cultural leadership. Yeah. You know, the, the, 
the liberal arts, I think I've mentioned this before, it comes from the Latin word liber, which is the Latin word for a free man as opposed to the hireling. And the liberal arts were the skills that you that you use to inculcate people who are going to be leaders of your culture. To you're, you're inculcating what it means to be able to think and act and behave in a free way. And I do think, though, that they're even more required now than ever before, because it was if we were to go back even just a hundred years, it, the, the idea that you would just have one skill and perform that one skill for your whole life is pretty expected. But now there's uh, everybody is expected to, to transition and to be able to shift laterally all the time. And, and that, um, that's where a liberal arts education helps you to be able to not so much to know just the skills for this, but to know how to learn, how to process, how to adapt, how to uh, communicate. Those are those are skills that trend uh, that that move laterally very quickly, but then also tend to move you up into leadership positions. And I think that that's something that that we do really well. And I think more people are seeing the advantage of that. I have I have more um, very successful um, businessmen um, writing me, wanting to meet with me, trying to figure out how can I intern NSA students in my career. Wow. The, the jobs for an NSA graduate are all over the place with, with great paychecks. But it's because they're looking for people that are not indoctrinated in woke culture, that are, that are, um, that are generally capable, that won't show up to work hungover or you know whoever knows what, what was going on the night before. That kind of thing is in, in high demand right now. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're just exploding at the moment. What... Uh... I don't know if you know these stats or not. What is the uh, percentage graduation rate for NSA students? And do you happen to know like a job placement rate once post-graduation? Yeah. So, yeah. So because we're so small, everything tends to be anecdotal. But like graduation rate, our graduation six-year degree completion rate would be 70%. Um, We have uh, our, I'll I'll say we have a a healthy attrition due to marriage. (laughs) Um, you know, uh, a couple of, yeah. couple of, it's, it's hard to stay going to school when you've now got a wife and two kids and you started as a single freshman, but now, you know, so, so there's, there's a decent attrition rate from, from that, but it's about 70% is our six year degree completion rate. Job placement. I'll be honest. I've never seen an NSA student who walked out and then didn't get a job. Yeah. I mean, that, that, it's um one of the things we do is we don't have dorms. We don't have dorms and we don't do student loans. And that means that when students come to NSA, they're getting an apartment and they're getting a job to work. Yeah. And they're, you know, most of them are working through college. And, and so when they graduate, the transition to uh, work is, I mean, that's just, of course, what you do. I don't, I mean, how would you not go get a job, get, get to work? Um, as well as I would also say, we do require them all to be worshiping at a local evangelical church. We yeah. don't say which one, but they, they have to be at a church. And so the when you graduate, you start a family, you get a job, and you get into a church. And that's yeah. just kind of what you do. It's because it's what you've been doing. Yeah. Well, that's that's actually, those, and those are really great distinctions to make. And uh, and this is, an, this is important. I, I know the answer to this, but there may be people listening that don't. But um I'm curious what the graduation percentage rate for uh, big ed colleges are, the average, because I can't remember what it is. But the reason I'm asking that is I know there's a lot of pressure from those universities and colleges to graduate those students because then they get more money from yeah. the big government, <laughs> right, from yeah. the feds. And you guys don't take money from the feds. You don't take take <laughs> governmental money. And so there isn't that pressure And so that's, I know, one reason why the education, the quality of the education is so much better and richer because you're not just trying to push kids through with a degree. You're actually taking the time to make sure they're they're learning. And when they leave, they are uh, uh, products of a good education, not products of the state. Yeah. And you can teach what you want. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, I think that not we don't take any federal money during COVID. We didn't take any of the PPP money. And then there was also a state allotment. Uh, I got a phone call from the state. They wanted to give us, I forget, it was 200000 or something. It was no, they kept saying it's no strings attached, nothing. We said, no, we don't want it. 
And then uh, shortly after, well, shortly after, about a year and a half later, all of a sudden they announced, oh, by the way, none of that money could have been spent on uh, religious, uh, for religious purposes. So Christian wow. colleges that took it are now going, how do I, how do I go back and, and deal with this? Uh, but yeah, we, we do not take uh, federal or state money. We stay out of it um, completely. Mm. Um, Dr. Mark, I had a question for you. I was curious to ask you about, um, you mentioned everything that NSA is trying to do, and it's relatively recent in terms of its existence, right? It hasn't been yeah. around for that long. Started and you, in 94. Right. You look at the landscape of Christian colleges, universities, I can't, it's hard, it's difficult for me to think in my mind, one that's been around for longer than 50 or 75 or 100 years now that still remains rigorously committed to its Christian foundations and scripture, if you will. Yeah. And I was just curious, um, why is that? Why, I mean, I, I have an idea of what I think, but I'd, like, I'd be curious to hear from you why that is. I think, I mean... The thing that I notice, and, and I don't know that I can quantify this or anything, but the thing that I've noticed in trend, you know, moving into being a college president and starting to show up at all the various college president functions is seeing the way that um, higher ed administration, the number one skill that is being cultivated um, or, or selected as you as you move your, your way up in the ranks is the ability to demonstrate compliance. Um, there, there are so many layers of restriction and, and whatnot on colleges from um, your accreditation, your state authorization, and then uh, and then all the federal financial aid. There, and most of it comes in at that federal financial aid level. There are so many restrictions that you're constantly trying to demonstrate compliance. And, and, and when, once you have cultivated your entire leadership um, you know, class is all about the ability to demonstrate compliance, you become an institution that is just going to easily be pressed into whatever cultural phenomena is going on. Um, and it's at the administrative level, but even at the faculty, everything is peer reviewed, everything. And so, so you're always trying to um, comply. And I think it's really interesting because like in the free market, the thing that is the thing that really sets you apart is when everybody breaks left and you break right and you're out on your own and you step into that space where nobody was. And it's terrifying like really terrifying to be there, but that's where all the action happens. And that's where like people get truly uh, promoted. You have that in your, in your, um, in your intro segment, I, I caught that quote from Doug about uh, the contrast between the, the, um, the brave men yeah. and then the people yeah. who come along and write the biographies yeah. afterward. Well, that's the, the brave man that goes there, but, but college leadership is really set up so that, man, if you, if you break right, you're toast you're really toast and nobody would do it. Um, and so I, I think that our call and, and I think that federal money has been a really, really big part of it. There's also, um, you know, the evangelical, like we, we think that the greatest virtue is being nice. So we don't mm -hmm. want to do the, thing. Um, we want to be people pleasers. Yeah. Wanna, so a lot of that plays in there as well. I, I think too, I think all of that makes sense. But when I think about it, I also think about, you mentioned Harvard and how that was originally founded and the motto of the school was from John chapter 17 is to know yeah. God and Jesus Christ. That's the bottom of all knowledge. That's the foundation okay. of it all. So it's an explicitly Christian foundation for knowledge. And I think where I see schools that have professed Christianity had this rigorous doctrinal commitment and they kind of trail away or they back off of that and compromise with what's going on in the culture is we've kind of believed in this lie also of intellectual neutrality that oh, yeah, this yeah. is just a common ground for all of us. Knowledge isn't ethical. It's not covenantal. Christ isn't at the bottom of wisdom and knowledge. The verse that you read <laughs> Luke, so, at the it's beginning. It's sort of this like, ex like romantic exploratory pursuit, like learning. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and it doesn't have that Christian foundation. This is kind of a, a neutral sphere. This is a common ground. There aren't, ethical implications for knowledge. And so we can just kind of appeal to the secular world um, on their own premise. We don't yeah. have to be rigorously tied to this anchor, but the problem of course with that is as soon as you start arguing on the premise of your enemy, 
it doesn't matter. You're on the train and it's going a direction. You're going that way, whether you want to or not. Right. And all of these institutions that have grown into big pharma, big ed, we do a lot of work with pro-life, pro-life movement. In many ways, the pro-life movement is big pro-life yeah. <laughs> in the sense Absolutely. that they have adopted secular foundations for their reasoning in their strategies and manner of engagement with the world, right? How can we appeal to people, um, not from an explicitly Christian foundation? Right. How do we get them using their argumentation, bring them in with that humanism, and then go, oh, what we're really about is this. This is who yeah. we really are. When yeah. we've kind of, you know, committed, uh, it, we've been false yeah. with our, our intentions from the right. beginning. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna ask you. Do you, you guys you remember like on Sesame Street when there was like which one of these does not belong? Mm -hmm. Do Do you feel like that, Ben, when you go to all these like uh, <laughs> yeah. president pre college? Which one of these things? kids is doing his own thing? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's me in the corner. <laughs> I'm sure as soon as you start talking, it's it's obvious. Uh, two two things. So I when, wanna... when I when I go to those meetings, it is it. I am so I feel so awkward and just like yeah. <laughs> That's it's hilarious. Weird. That's hilarious. Um, so two things I wanted to touch on. Uh, one, you, you brought up something in my mind. It's kind of loosely related, but, um, you know, talking about uh, free men and, you know, the the founders of our nation starting colleges. And by weren't like I think all of the Ivy League schools were Christian at their foundations, weren't they? Many. And, yeah. 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 Um, uh, but uh, I was listening to I just finished actually this really excellent series on the canon plus app on the war of independence doug taught a bunch of those and steve wilkins and uh but one of the things i don't remember who who was teaching and which lesson it was but uh they were saying that like during the war of independence they the and this is literally the reverse of what i would have thought like i think he said the average the standard of living for an, the americans was like five times greater than that of the englishmen and I and it like blew my mind, and I was like, "Wait, what?" I had to rewind it and listen to it again. But it's because of everything you were just saying, they were free. Uh, yeah. you know, they came over here, they started their own business they, from scratch, literally, and they had the freedom. It's because they were free to do what they wanted to do, yeah. and they didn't have a tyrannical overlord telling them how to live their lives. And we've obviously come far from that. But the other, um, you know, I'm stealing this from Doug as well. I remember one of the comments he made that just kind of has always stuck with me was um, when those, when those pilgrims first landed on the uh, Eastern coast of America, um, how many jobs were there? You know, <laughs> how many jobs were there, yeah. but how much work was there? Yeah. Um, and, and the difference between the hireling and the free man is the hireling looks for jobs and the free man looks for work. You know, where 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 I see what I could do and what I could do mm -hmm. with it versus I get permission from somebody to work for them. It, it's it's a very yeah. it's two very different things. That's man, that's an excellent point. That's really good. Um, yeah. So this next thing I want I want Joy to chime in on this. Uh, you know, us men know that God gives us our wives because we need help. And uh, we need to help me. And my wife texted me. She said, you sound like a chauvinist. I was joking earlier about the the knitting and all that. Stuff. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, but I want to I want to. But she made, she brought up a good point. I want because I want Joy to tag in on this. And uh, I mean, if, for those of you listening that don't know, uh, Ben's father in law is Doug Wilson. And so that's either a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not sure. For us, it's a good thing. <laughs> That, but that may it's a good thing for me. Yeah, it's a good thing for you. And we we've I've joked with you before, like, uh, you know, I don't I don't flatter people just for the sake of flattery. Ben is a very intelligent man. I look up to him. He's one of the smartest people I know. But uh, you've probably written the least out of anyone into the family you married it to, and like, you know, that includes Becca, your wife, and yeah. Rachel, and. Um, Let's and, not forget Nate. Yeah, yeah but I'm, I'm, I'm focusing yeah. on the women specifically because my, my wife texted me. She said, you know, like you, Doug has said, like, to not educate uh, our daughters is to not educate our grandsons. And so, you know, when I was joking about that earlier, my, you know, my point is like, yeah, I still want my daughters to not be just dumb dumbs that stay at home yeah. and, you know, cook things. Like, I still want them to be intelligent and be able because they're going to then teach my grandkids and um so i just wanted to hear i i thought i'm glad she she brought that up and it's a great point and i wanted to hear joy's thoughts on that 
Well, I mean, I like the distinction that you made, Ben, about a job versus work. Um, And I think that uh, being a wife and a mom or even just a single lady in the church is there's a lot of work for women, especially work done uh, cheerfully and faithfully. Um, And I, I do think it's a little unfortunate that we've started to view the tasks and work for women as a job that you kind of clock in and out of. And I think it's created, well, it's created laziness. And then I think there's entitlement that kind of jumps on once (laughs) the laziness goes by. Um, And yeah, so I think that um, obviously I, I think women should be educated. I think that, you know, goes without saying. Um, And I think that they're, are, there's plenty of education that can be accessed without attending, um, you know, a building. Sure. Um, and, and so that when whether or not you would actually go attend at an, a physical school would be totally your business. Mm-hmm. And I would recommend if, if you're a lady, a young lady listening, your father's business, <laughs> certainly <laughs> um, ask, ask your dad and your mom. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, uh, I, I, there's a lot of work for women that may not require you to go to a building. But I also think that um, uh, all the very smart and shrewd women that I know seek more, uh, maybe more formally educated work in a clever way as a means to... Um, you know, obviously there's like people who write books. There's, that's an enormous contribution. Uh, Becca has made an enormous Mm. contribution. Um, that's Ben's wife for any of you guys that don't know that. Um, and then, um, you know, you're making it, you're making an enormous contribution to the education of your own children. Um, but there's also, I mean, there's also, uh, no problem at all with a woman that, um, is clever in the way that she works to maybe even bring extra money into her household. Um, And all of those things do not uh, preclude formal education. Uh, So that would just be something that you would have to make sure you're, I mean, you would just have to approach school intelligently, which I think is something that we just need to do more Mm -hmm. in general. general. (laughs) But yeah. the thing is, if, if you make that distinction between, um, you know, I have to get this job and or I have to get this degree in order to get this job. Once you do that, then it makes all college education about formal um, uh, career and employment. And if you have a woman who aspires to be a wife and a mom, then you've made college education kind of um, an, an, an unnecessary, possibly even an impediment. But if you say that, no, 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 the, the college is, it's not for everybody, but for those for whom it fits with their natural talents and whatnot, um, it's about making you a certain kind of person. Well, then all of a sudden, it's a great place for um, young women to be as well. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be because they have a, uh, a feminist agenda or whatever career aspiration. Um, it could be, I want to be a really good wife and mom, and that's why I'm going to college. I know that that was really why NSA was first started was because Becca um, was the first student. Um, my, my three daughters, my, my oldest daughter just graduated. Um, and uh, actually the f- funny thing is, is she's about to go to cooking school for three months and it's, it's purely for <laughs> that's <laughs> irony right there. <laughs> yeah, it's purely for the heck of it. It's sort of that's like, uh, yeah, no, it, she's treating herself. She's going to the Cordon Bleu school nice. of cooking. Cool. Because I, I think she just wants the adventure. Um, but, uh, but she did NSA to be a certain kind of person. Um, and, and, you know, um, a lot of this, you know, is honestly my wife's book, even exile, I think kind of captures a lot of what mm-hmm. we're describing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it was, it's a documentary on the canon app, but the other thing is yesterday, I think another documentary just dropped called, um, come and welcome or something like that. It's about, um, uh, hosting people. It's, it's like for women on um, hosting company, mm. the thing is funny about it is uh, my daughter, the one who's headed to cooking school, she's the one who produced the whole thing. Um, wow. She's quite, 
quite talented and it comes out of that NSA education, but it's not because this is, you yeah. know, she's aspiring to be a full time in this field. Yeah. Um, but awesome. all, all of my daughters are going through uh, NSA because I want them to be this kind of person. Yeah. Come and see is what it's called. In yeah. case anyone's go. interested. Okay. Well, and then certainly I don't think it's wrong, uh, you know, because education is more about the type of person you want to be. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that little 30% drop off rate if you do happen to find someone yeah <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you just yeah. you know you're like you said there there's some back-to-back -back kids and all of a sudden you're like oh this is not i'm busy continuing <laughs> this education right, right. now is yeah. not a right a, you yeah. know um yeah. but that's that just goes back to it's so funny because women are painted as this marginalized mm -hmm. group but what we're talking about is the free woman right. that is free to say um, I, I was going to school and now I can yeah. go be a wife and a mom. Yeah. Um, I can lay my life down this way right, right now. Yeah. yeah. So Ben, when you asked Doug to uh, pursue Becca, was he like, yes, you can marry her. And if you become the president of NSA. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, Doug, it's so funny because everybody thinks that when I like for me to go and pursue Becca and go talk to Doug about Becca must have been like terrifying. Like he would be this like really scary, whatever. Um, Doug was the coolest dad ever, uh, as far as um I think I was making maybe five hundred dollars a month. I was living at this apartment called the crack house, and all I had was a motorcycle. Um and and like after my motorcycle, my next most valuable possession was probably my watch. Um, and uh, so the fact that I thought I was ready to marry somebody is hilarious. And Doug was utterly unfazed by it. And he was always far more concerned about, um, you know, what was my faithfulness? What are my ambitions? What kind of man do I want to be? And I think he saw he saw what what I was going to be and um that was just never really a weird, um, big part of the conversation, yeah. strangely. That's hilarious. And, you know, actually, we've been uh, uh, listening to a series um, with my daughters that, that your mother-in-law did, Nancy, uh, mm. called Keep It Simple. And it, it's for young teenage girls. It's about dating and boys and all this stuff. And there was several stories she's told about your wife that had me die and laughing but i think one of them i think it was becca because she was saying that she was like uh she had she had she said she still has a hard time saying no um and uh and there was a story about some some young man that wanted to speak to her or call her on the phone or something and she's like well you you know you gotta ask my dad or whatever and, and she approached doug about it and doug was like well said something about like uh, you can do better than a boring person or something like something along those lines. And so, yeah, yeah. She, so she just tells him like, no, uh, you know, I can do better than a boring person or something like something very direct like that. It was hilarious. So you're laughing. But, uh, not much has changed. I don't think. Uh, but uh, anyways, I just was laughing. Um, well, speaking of, of Beck, I, I actually, we played the reform con. This is a good place to talk about this. We played the reform con uh, commercial at the beginning um, it's coming up very quickly, um, and so we'd love to have you guys there. Jeff did not mention uh, Ben's name because he did that prior to us locking Ben in, but Ben's going to be speaking there as well. I'm very, very excited about that, and he'll be bringing Becca with him. Looking forward to it. And Becca is doing a mashup with Sheologians, um, so Joy and Summer, who will have had – just That's given birth, um, so I had <laughs> she'll to, have yeah. Oh, there may be a baby on stage. I don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but looking very, very forward to that, and very yeah. excited about about that opportunity yeah, as well. So I wanted to mention that. So come check it out, reformcon.org. You can get your tickets there. Um, anything else you want to add? I don't think so. This has been great. Anything else you want to add, Ben? Anything you want to add? Um, I, I'll give the closing observation would be that, um, I think that, um, um the evangelical church, we've been entirely pre-mill about our approach oh. to education. So, um, yeah, every, everything is about, um, we're always on the defense and trying to figure out how to get out of and how to not have that impact us. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the pre thing has always been, uh, don't build institutions cause they're just going to be taken over by liberals. Um, and, and I think we, we see, we've seen through that in certain places. I don't know that we've seen through it in Ed. And the one thing I would say is it's time that we retake the schools and we probably are going to have to build them. 
Um, yep, but uh, right. we should we should quit backing up, quit reversing, quit abandoning, quit surrendering, and we should start retaking and building our own because uh, this land is still price, and we need to um, build the institutions that are going to graduate the leaders to lead it. Oof. So bizarre Oof. to me that Christians say that as yeah. if, you know, we think about the church, Jesus is building his church and he's using us as his partners to do that. Should we not build that institution? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's an institution, yeah. you know, yeah. but all of these other fields under Christ's lordship, as you just said, yeah. matter just as much. Man, I, I, I love that. I'm so glad you said that. And I, Colossians chapter one has been so impactful on me just you know, Christ came to reconcile all things, heaven and earth, and and that's part of our part of the mission of the church is to reconcile all things. And that includes education. You know, I, that's yeah. such a great point that you brought up. the The church is really. Why do you think uh, all the uh, Ivy League schools are trash? Why are they all woke? Uh, mm -hmm. Because the Christians abandoned them. Because we were, you know, and it has to do with eschatology. Instead of thinking long term and. Uh, the way that the founders of those institutions thought, you know, now we switch to just waiting to be raptured off. And, yeah. and uh, yeah, I mean, but you're, you're right in that, you know, those institutions are, are gone. I think, you know, I mm -hmm. think it's much easier. It's going to be a much easier task. Like you said, to just start new ones yeah. um, with that forward thinking and, and just say, all right, you, you know, that's a lot of, it's going to take out way too much work and effort to try to, to reestablish those those institutions. Oh, well, we eventually, talk about that. Yeah. eventually, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, because of the decline in population and being the problem behind enrollment, right. eventually those buildings will just sit vacant, That's and then the right. Christians can buy Bingo. them up. That's right. And uh, we'll Thanks put for we'll put back the stained glass and bingo. <laughs> yeah, bingo. That's what you guys are doing in Moscow, right? I mean, a little, little bit of that. Yeah, yeah, reclaiming those. Buildings. You literally, yeah, because you literally basically. It wasn't quite a brothel, but it was pretty close. <laughs> yeah, about we, we just, yeah. it, it's great. I, I mentioned all the growth and enrollment. So we bought this old, it was a skeezy nightclub called Cadillac Jacks. Still has the stripper pole up in the, in the first floor. But we bought that and we've been going through gutting it and just turning it into classrooms. And the first section of all new classrooms and everything just came online last week. And we got it done just in time for this new um huge uh freshman class and they're all in classes in that building now oh, that's awesome. pretty you're gonna just yeah, keep wow. that stripper pole with the sign that says in memorium like just <laughs> is my... well, I, mean... I keep i keep joking that i'm waiting for that donor who's like i want to pay to bring that thing down so we can finish the building that's funny but he can have the pole but i actually yeah. we tear down the assure pole <laughs> yeah we we had the pleasure of going to a fundraiser there when you had just got it i think and it was gross yeah. It was oh yeah like I mean we went did a tour of the whole thing and it was I mean you like didn't want to touch the walls like it was yeah. just it was nasty like it was like oh man I I spent way too long with the previous owner trying to land that deal walking through that building and getting to know him and and the stories are pretty intense Ugh. but if you came now parts of it parts of it are still like oh that's scary but parts of it you'd walk in and you would not recognize whatsoever it's just completely different mm. praise god that's what we're talking about that's taking great. dominion reconciling even cadillac jacks that's right so, yeah bye jack <laughs> so hit the road jack. <laughs> <laughs> awesome man well thank you brother for being on um i appreciate it a ton and we'll we'll definitely be doing more with you here in the future and we look forward to having you here uh with I'm us in October. To my time down there all right well guys any closing thoughts no, good show. Mm -hmm. Good show. Uh, as always, thank you to our supporters. Uh, speaking of uh, higher, or not higher, but better education, uh, you can get a free Bonson U account at Apologia Studios mm -hmm. by signing up. Uh, there's a plethora of lectures and goodies there, like over 3,000. He has so. a lot to say so about education. He did too, have a lot so. to say about education. Um, so you can go there, check that out. Thank you, everyone, for supporting an abortion now. Um, and uh, our efforts there, uh, as we've discussed, uh, the falling of Roe is just the beginning, and we have a long ways to go. And uh, that's you know that's why Jeff's speaking in Houston right now. He was in Georgia last week meeting with uh, legislators. We're going to have a bill in Georgia this year 
I'm very excited about. I just was speaking with Brian Gunter in Louisiana, getting ready to plan the rally and the bill again next year in Louisiana. And uh, I see we got Trey, Trey Fisher's on the chat mm -hmm. today. Um, and uh, love you, Trey. Uh, but anyways, thank you, everyone. You make this happen. So praise God for that. And uh, we will see you next week.